I am so excited to talk to this week's guest because this man was way too nice to me when I was at ESPN. He had no reason to be so nice to me, but of all the big stars there, all the big shots there, dare I say, he was one of the very nicest to me. Always checking in, texting and whatnot. I appreciate him very much. He's a living legend. He's one of the greatest of all time in sports broadcasting history, one of the greatest sports center anchors of all time. He is a personality unlike any other. He's the one and only Kenny Maine. Kenny, how are you, my friend? You read all those books? Yes. I'm, uh, I just finished this one right over here. Mm -hmm. I'm reading a couple. I, I've been bad about reading. I love reading. And for some reason, uh, you'd think the pandemic would have been a better to write. Like, what's there to do? Sit back. And I think I'm just too anxious all the time. I'm always wanting to be on the move. But I'm going to dedicate myself to finishing the books I'm into because of that inspiration right there. What are you reading right now? I got it right here. Oh. 1619. Okay. Controversial. Uh, um, why, what is it about? Uh, well, it's about American history and the fact that the country was born in slavery. And it's a lot of the controversy I'm speaking of is like what's going on around the country where they're trying to block teaching American history in a way that would potentially make white people feel like uh, we're... We did something bad back way back when, when in mm -hmm. fact, that's kind of true. So it right. <laughs> uh, doesn't make all white people bad. doesn't make the country bad. doesn't make the ideals the country was founded on bad, but it's the truth. And, and it's funny because the whole critical race theory thing, man, we're just going heavy right out of the gate. I love uh, it. It's only taught in, in certain places like high level, you know, about how institutionalized institutionalization of, you know, the unfairness of one race being put above another. That's not like widely taught in grade schools and stuff, but, but teaching grade school kids about the true origins of the country, the truth, you know, about how the country was founded and what people have suffered in this country. That's not, that's a good thing that, right. that like, that like gets us in a conversation where maybe we can get to equality and maybe we can live up to the ideals that are so beautifully written in the constitution, but you know, they weren't exactly lived up to way back then or even now. At this point in your life, Kenny, because obviously I follow you on social media and whatnot, the vast majority of of the things that you're tweeting about are political history, things like that. It's not a lot of sports. Would it be fair to say that you're more interested in that world than you are in the day-to-day -day sports world at this point? That's a fact. I probably was in the first place. Um, I mean, when I started out, I played football back in college way back when. And I always and I was taking broadcasting and political science and, and English and debate and all these different things. I always wanted to be more serious. I wanted to read all those damn books behind you. Right. I wanted to be like doing PBS frontline at this point in my career and doing serious stuff. But what happened was I got this job on local TV in Seattle. I started doing like news reporting after a couple of years of you know being a production assistant and a producer. And all of a sudden, we had no news on the weekends. It was a Monday through Friday, small place. We always joke that if there's news on the weekends, it's news to us. That should be our motto. <laughs> but they, they added a weekend, a couple weekend shows. And Jack Eddie was my boss, my, my news director. He's like, you played football, you're doing sports. It was just like that. It was like, and, and I was kind of like, mm, I didn't want to do sports. I want to do news. I want to do serious stuff. But sports became so fun and was such an outlet, I think, for my personality I just started drifting over there. So it's like my vocation, you know, became doing broadcasting and sports and my avocation, you know, considering all the other things that mattered to me in my life. Was the dream initially like frontline, something like that? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Or, you know, be uh, Ken Burns is, is, is a model, like, you know, doing real serious, long term projects and, and, and who knows, maybe I, maybe there's still a chance I can do some of that. But, um, but yeah, it was funny because everybody thought, oh, he played football. Not that I was any good, but, you know, I went to college and played football there. The unnatural that you then go into sports broadcasting. And I always, I always felt like, man, that's so cliche. It's like I can do I can do something different than that. And most of my time and energy was put into this. So my favorite class by far was political films, it was called. And you went once a week, night class. You'd watch a movie. First, you'd review last week's and read the papers. Then you'd watch a political movie and then you'd write a paper on it and come back. But, you know, kind of opened my eyes to a lot of things. 
even when you were in your prime, you know, in the midst of your tremendous 27 year and I believe one month run at ESPN, uh, was there ever a point where you were like, yeah, I'm itching to go back into that world. I, I want to try out, you know, the political reporting life. Did, like, did you ever feel like you were close to leaving and completely pivoting into that world? Um, there were a couple other times where I was close to leaving, but I wasn't sure what for. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> empty threat. Um, yeah, I don't know. I That's a good question. I mean, to do it all over again, my passion would have been the other, but it's kind of hard to change horses in the middle of the stream at that point when you put so much time and, and probably, to be really honest, probably got used to the lifestyle that I was leading, the money that I was making, doing the things I was doing, being in commercials. It was kind of hard you know, given this, and I got remarried, so we have four daughters together. So like, there are a lot of reasons to kind of keep doing what I was doing economically, like for the good of my family, and yet still keep my hand in the other in the little bit of a way that I have, like you mentioned on Twitter. And and it's funny, because not that I have any great power or anything, but I do believe in one person making a difference, influencing another, you know, it's not like I would proclaim something and I think, you know, legions of people are going to follow my command. It's not like that. It's more Maybe wake up some people like, hey, read this article or, hey, listen to this viewpoint. Mm -hmm. Th you know, things are a little bit different now than they were maybe 10 or so years ago. And I've heard you talk about this supposed Twitter watch list that you were on and they would tell you, you know, hey, maybe don't talk about uh, the president's physical and Trump and all this stuff. But did you ever feel like you were not being true to yourself at any point when you had to think twice about tweeting about something that meant a lot to you, that you believed in, that you cared about, and you're like, eh, you know, I work for Disney, I can't do that. Did that disappoint you? Did you feel like you were letting yourself down because you had to censor yourself, you know, at, at the expense of not getting in trouble or getting that phone call? Oh, for sure. I mean, I always said I shot from beyond the Jamel line, so <laughs> it kind of as a joke and kind of as a tribute to Jamel Hill, because she, you know, she went down, she went down low. She was like, I mean that in a good way, like banging in the paint, yeah. there, like making plays. And the rest of us were like, oh, am I going to get nicked for this? Am I going to get in trouble for this? Should I say it in such a way? Hopefully I get my point across, but it doesn't cross the line where they might, you know, be upset about it. And again, when, I, when people ask that question or I talk about it, I'm not like slamming the company. Like I get why they didn't want the problem, 100%. Um, but it's, it's sort of like the policy was really – not so much you can and can't do this. It was, will there be an impact or will there not be? So if you said something and nothing happened, it's like the old, you know, if you yell in the forest and nobody hears it. But if somebody said something and it, and it got picked up and all of a sudden it's controversial, now you were kind of like, hey, you can't be talking that way. You can't say this. You know, there weren't that many examples where I thought I was so overt about what I was saying. I Oftentimes, I'd quote a Stevie Wonder song that spoke to, here's where I feel today based on what's happening in the news today. And some people really got it. And some people thought I'd really like Stevie Wonder, which I do. But, you know, I definitely, to to answer that question, felt like I sold out in a few cases. Like, uh, I kind of went halfway, didn't I? Because I was protecting, you know, mm -hmm. my income and my job. So I, I didn't actually necessarily want to start in this department, but I'm happy that we did. I actually wanted to start with a thank you. Um, you helped me out greatly, even though you didn't know that you were helping me out, because I left ESPN around the same time that you left ESPN. I left on June 15th. I believe your last day was June 1st, correct? May 24th was my last show, but May 31st was my last work day. And so you were there for 27 years and one month. I was there for three years. And I was feeling sad around the time, early May, when you announced that you were leaving, when you put that tweet out saying that, you know, you were a salary cap casualty, if you will, and uh, you would do eight or so more shows and then you would be leaving. I was, I was in my feelings. I was feeling sad because my dream of going to ESPN and being a Kenny Mayne or a Chris Berman or a Dan Patrick and being there for 20 years was ending a lot sooner than I expected. And I felt a certain way about it. And I felt like I was wronged and all this stuff. And then I saw the way you handled it. And then I read your LA Times piece and I saw that you were kind of leaving with your head held high and not taking shots and not feeling sorry for yourself. At least that's what you were saying to the public. And I was like, if this guy who was there for 27 years is feeling this way. I can't feel sorry for myself. I was only there for three years. And so you actually helped me kind of like snap out of it. 
and hold my head high and say I made it and it was all good. And you know, better days are ahead. So I appreciate that very much. Even though I know you were just, you know, it was it was the way you were feeling. You weren't doing it for anyone else, but you really did help me. I I will always feel somewhat connected to you because we left that around the same time. Even though you were there twenty four years longer than I was, it really truly did help me. So thank you for that. I heard that from somebody else who left before I did about the way I handled, and I didn't. I wasn't putting on some show. I. The whole story you're referring to, for those who don't know, um, John Walsh, who was one of the you know exalted leaders of ESPN for decades, he called just to you know give me his best, like hey, hang in there, something good will come. You know, he was giving me like an attaboy little phone call, and then he, I think he called the second time, and said, "Look, I want you to do something. I think you should write, write out your own story, write your thoughts. Just next time you got the free hour, just sit down, let it pour out." And I wrote the thing in like 90 minutes did a couple of corrections later. And he said, write a good story about whatever you want. What's on your mind? What happened? Where are you going? What happened before? How'd you get there? Because everybody else is writing about you or telling their version of why you left and speculating and so forth. Why don't you just do it and own it yourself? So it's almost like John Walsh, who doesn't even work there anymore, is not even my boss anymore. I still felt like it was an assignment that I owed him because he's one of the guys that, you know, pushed me along during during my time there. And so I did. And I'm glad I did it. And I, and I, I don't think, I don't think I had to fake anything. I didn't do like, here's my real story. Here's my story for the public, but here's how I really feel to other people. I mean, it, they made it a business decision that I was worth X amount. That's totally their right to do it. You know, first day, like, oh, they don't think as much of me as, you know, so that it hits you on your ego that way. But right after is like, that's fine. They, it's their building. They get to choose who they want to promote or who they don't they had come to the conclusion that for what I was doing for the company, I wasn't worth what I was making. And they cut it way back. I looked at that number and just looked at it like in gambling terms, like they set the over under on me, right? They said, they set a line on me. I was like, what the hell? Let's, let's go see if we can play the over. And I did. And, and, it, and it all worked out. So I knew I'd be forgotten there, you know, after two weeks, they're going to still do shows. They get on the, on and off the air really well. They got great people. They're still doing great shows. And I got to go and do something else and open up different opportunities, free myself a little more on Twitter. And like everybody did OK, like it's OK. I have read that you say that you, you don't have an agent. I'm assuming that's still the case, right? True. For those that don't know, somewhat of an anomaly in this business. Most people have an agent. Uh, you can make a case that it's a crazy thing. And in most lines of work, you don't need an agent, but it's just kind of the way the system has has been built. Do you think if you had an agent, the negotiations with ESPN would have gone differently? No, because I know a bunch of people who have agents who were caught in the same thing where if you want to stay, you're going to have to take some kind of cut. And then, you know, they're handful of other people who stayed at the level or even moved up that's their choice again they i'm gonna we're gonna put our resources in this person or that person or this show or that show um but i know other people who did stay who do have agents who did have to you know take a cut to to stay around it was just a directive from disney saying we need to make more money so we need to cut here there and everywhere to i don't know what i don't know the particulars of was it a percentage thing or was it a total dollar thing or whatever it was but I was, when I said that, I said it kind of to be funny, but also the truth of I'm a salary cap casualty, which kind of true, right? Like, right. We got back and, and I was one of the cuts. Just curious. And I know this is somewhat like inside TV baseball, if you will, but did you ever have an agent? And uh, if so, why don't you have one now? <laughs> People have asked me that, including age. I don't know. I think I've had, yes, I have had different agents in the past and I don't want to like, you know, knock all of them at once, like they just didn't work for me. I think mm -hmm. it's because, and it's probably my fault more than anything, because I'm so hands-on. I'd be like, so what'd you do today? Who'd you call today? What happened? To, you know, I'd want the down the to be downloaded on what did you do on my behalf today? If I was going to give you 10 or 15% of whatever happened, I kind of deserve to know what you did. Like if you take your car in to get fixed, don't you usually ask, okay, what'd you do today? Why am I paying you $800? You know, right. You, you get a little rundown. And I just think I was never satisfied with the job that was being done. So I, was, I think I advocate for myself better than anybody. I wonder sometimes, am I viewed differently when I go to talk to people? Oh, he doesn't have an agent. He'll be a pushover. You know, some people probably take that approach. And then sometimes they find otherwise that I'm, no, I'm going to pass on that because I don't 
like the terms of what you're offering. That I'm not as easy as they think I might be just because I don't have an agent. And I also have zero pride. Like I'll just pick up the phone and shoot for the moon. And if I don't succeed on something, I'll try the next guy and or girl. Um, so I don't know. It's too late now. I'm I'm happy if some agent listening wants to bring me a deal and take a percentage on that one-off thing, sure, let's do it. But I don't know that I need at this point somebody to advocate for me. I think I think I'm gonna take my shot on my own. Have you watched Sports Center since you left ESPN? Yeah. It's weird. I was just telling Gretchen, my wife, mm-hmm. it's weird watching. What was I watching? Oh, NBA All-Stars, uh, the celebrity night. And I think we watched the show afterward. And it, it's weird because I know most of the people. I'm friends with many of the people still. And it's weird. I know that I'm not in their club anymore. You know what I mean? Like I'm over here. I used to do it, but I don't anymore. So there is a little oddity in watching something you used to do so much or this building, you know, that produces all this stuff. But it's not like with great lament. I'm not like sad, like, oh, poor me. I'm not with them. And, you know, it's more just it's it's unusual. It's it's like mm. it's probably like somebody who's on a team, you know, an athletic team, no longer on the team. Who knows? Maybe they're off. Hey, I got a call from potential spam. Should we get it? They, they call often. Okay. Oh, they're annoying. Yeah, they're the worst. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there, OK, but now that you're eight months, eight months. I, from haven't, I'm sorry, I haven't like gone out of my way like i'm not gonna watch espn nothing like that if there's something on espn worth watching i'll watch i don't kill myself to watch anything every night but i never did even when i worked there so right so uh, i'm just curious eight months removed like do you have any resentment the way to to, towards the way things went down the way it ended you know sometimes it ends in a way where it's like hey you know we're not gonna decrease your salary by 61%, your time by 14%. Like, you know, that, that, that is a blow to the ego. Do you have any resentment now that the dust has settled? I don't, I really don't like. Good for you. I got into something else that, you know, perfectly replaced what I was doing as far as getting by. It's totally different what I'm doing. You know, there, there's a different pace to it certainly. And, and it, it, it's taken a while to adjust to not doing as much, I guess. But that's, it's funny because most people are like, wait a minute, you're getting paid the same and you do less. That's what everybody wants. Yes and no, because I think I'm, I always want to be creating stuff and it feels weird to not have something particular to point to. Like I always knew if I was doing Sports Center, all right, I got four shows this week. They're all on 11. Two of them are after basketball games. Like you kind of have a handle on what it feels like and what the anticipation expectation is going to be with what I'm doing now. It's for Caesars, um, you know, it's a little bit of this, then a lot of nothing, then a little bit of this. And so it's kind of a yo-yo as far as your creativity being up and down. I'm always kind of thinking of stuff, but, and I also have the opportunity to pitch other people as long as it doesn't conflict with Caesars. Um, and I've done a few things for NBC and got a couple other projects that we're pitching. As long as I'm not advocating for some other uh, gaming site, then I'm, I'm free to, to do other things as well. But yeah, it's it's definitely a different pace, I guess, is the biggest change. So you are working for Caesar Sportsbook. Um, as you mentioned, Peacock, you did some uh, Summer Olympic shows for them every night with uh, Carrie Champion, another former ESPNer. Uh, you've done some commercials, Olipop. You've uh, done uh, some play-by-play of some kids' mini golf. Mm-hmm. I'm curious if, you are, if you're looking for, like, would you be open to another sort of daily gig? Are you looking for something like that or... At this point in your life, do you want, you know, the project here, the project there, and less of a rigid schedule? Yeah, I think the the latter, the project here, project there. Because now I don't see because because also where else what else am I gonna do where I am, right? I don't want to necessarily move somewhere to show up five days a week and be in a studio. It doesn't I did that. Like, and that's not mm-hmm. putting down anybody's doing it or putting down that job if it were offered. It's just we're in a situation where it feels like I've signed up for, I guess I have when I, when I say it feels like I just say what I am doing. It's like, I have an endorsement thing. That's a good deal. Like I, I do, I just was at the Super Bowl doing little comedy bits with Allison Becker, my friend, the actor, she was in parks and rec. She was on main street back at ESPN, Larry David show, dark hair, funny. You know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah. we did like a fake, football show, a fake Super Bowl preview show. 
and shot them all in a couple hours, actually at her house. It was kind of funny the way it all worked out. And I've been in one of their commercials. I've gone to Vegas a couple of times. I think I'm doing some stuff for March Madness coming up. But it is just like when I worked at ESPN and there'd be a commercial opportunity, it'd be one or two days. Hey, you're flying to LA or you're in a movie part very briefly. And it's just this special one-off thing. Now I'm just doing a series of special one-off things, right? So it takes a little adjustment from sort of the work that I used. I know I'm kind of all over the place. I'm, I'm letting out, I'm letting out my feelings about the change. In my this is good. <laughs> this is good. I like this. No, it's it, very, it really, very healthy. It, it, it took a while. I don't think I'm all the way there. It, it's taken a while to like, oh, this is what I do now. Because I was, I did something for 27 years. That's a long time to do something, even though I did a whole bunch of different jobs at ESPN. It's really weird to like, oh, you don't do that anymore. Now you're, you're in this other thing. You got to kind of get used to the pace of that. But the great thing about it is, as I was talking about earlier, I have a couple other projects. One of them I'm pitching with John Skipper's group, my old boss at ESPN, who's down there with Metal Arc and Dan Levitard and all them. Don't know if it'll sell or won't sell, but we'll find out. We're pitching it right now. And, and there's another longer shot project uh, that I probably shouldn't even say what it is. But, um, you know, other stuff might just come up, too. Somebody could just call and go. In fact, I am. I got asked to be in a movie, very, very small part, like a one day. I'm probably on screen for nine seconds. But that's fun, right? Like a different yeah. thing that I wouldn't necessarily have fallen into otherwise. Uh, those commercials were legendary, the this Sports Center commercials. How many were you in total? Do you know? Well, when we say commercials, we most of us favored the kind for companies where you got money, even sure. more than the This is Sports Center, where you used to sign a contract for one dollar. I think I think they did it for legal reasons, and they finally like nobody's getting paid the dollar anyway. No, those were a blast to be in. They were good fun to be in good for you right good promotion your yeah. own self-promotion um gosh. you never got paid an extra cent for them no wow it was okay voluntary and in fact not just voluntary but a bit of a dog fight to uh not to use that term wrongly um to get in them to get the spot yeah oh, who didn't want to be in them i mean they were, they sure. always turned out well it was kind of cool like oh i was in that one i was with so-and-so this or that athlete my favorite one was with Stuart Scott. It was called the Big Buddy Program. That's my favorite too. Dan with Patrick Jason Williams. Yeah. And he says something like, you know, we like to give back to the community and everybody just, you know, finds time to help the kids or, you know, however he set it up. Yeah. Stuart and I go to this gym in Bristol. In fact, the funny part is we were doing a show that night at a sports center at 11 or 12. So we had to go shoot it, hustle back, prepare for a show. Like it was a little bit of a scramble. There was no script. It was just do whatever you want, be a jerk. You know, those were your notes. And Stuart checks some kid and, you know, he's doing this to him and I'm screaming at the kid for the ball and yelling at the kid on the ground, like your parents signed the permission slip. Off. <laughs> it was such a fun and silly, like laughing the whole time. We had to keep starting over. Um, I love the Charlie Steiner, follow me to freedom on Y2K. I had a very brief part in that. There was one with Dikembe Mutombo, where we're lying on the grass, staring at cloud shapes, talking about that one. And he has that great voice, you know? Yes. Um, there was another one. I can't remember who it was. It was a boxer and I, I cannot remember his name where we are, are putting pop tarts in a toaster, but he has boxing gloves on. It was just the, Oh yes. The city of, of, of that happening. You know, did you ever pitch any yourself? Like, did oh, yeah. you ever, and, and it made it to television? Um, well, more often they'd have, what they wanted and then we'd kind of do what we want so that was you okay know, they i can't remember did they ever literally take here's a whole concept right there was a little bit of uh i don't know what the best way to phrase th there's some ownership issues there they they wanted to be in charge and that's I fine see. it was you know it was their product but Will we ever get to the point where those are a thing again in other words it feels to me and correct me if you feel otherwise Sports Center is a brand. Obviously, um, we know that. We also know that the highlight show, you know, will never be the same because of the internet and phones and whatnot. But it does feel to me like they have decided, at least for now, and things change all the time, right? That it's about the brand less so than the personalities, right? And I think what made Sports Center so great back in the day were the personalities, you and Rich Eisen and Stuart Scott, Oberman, Patrick, et cetera. And so do you feel like those days are are long gone and now they've just decided we're going to stick with the brand. We'll put 
with all due respect, you know, interchangeable parts and uh, younger talent, cheaper talent. But it's not so much going to be about you guys, the stars, the personalities. We're tuning in to watch Sports Center rather than you, because we would tune in to watch you, right? Like you guys were the stars in my opinion. I wanted to see what you would say, how you would say it, how funny you were. Do you feel like those days are over now? I don't know. They, I think to say that because I've heard that positive before, where that kind of that's kind of a put down of many of the people who are there who are really talented, who are really funny, who are clever. So I'm. You'd have to poll the viewers, right? Who do they like these days? Do they like watching this person or that person? But as far as answering the question about the this is Sports Center, I'm not sure why they ever did go away from it. It was working, you know. Just. Do another batch every quarter. Let's come up with five more or whatever the number was. You'd have to ask others as to what their plans are for how they market the, the product. But I don't know that I agree. The, the reason why the old days were the old days and so good is partly what you started to allude to is like when we came on the air, you had no earthly idea who won the magic jazz game. None. Unless you right. knew somebody in Utah or, or Florida, right? Or unless you had, uh, you know, access to the radio call, you know, <laughs> you had a shortwave radio at home or something. And there was the mystery. In, and in fact, a lot of people don't know this, too. The anchors often don't know until they get the highlight, the moment it's airing. Wow. There, there was, in the old days, this this um, sort of protocol where they bring up the tapes and you get a chance to review a couple of your highlights or more if, if they were done early. But more and more of the shows I was doing in the last several years... I had never. I saw the games that I watched, a couple of games that I had on my monitors, and before I went up to put my tie on. But other than that, you're reliant on the kid running in the door, handing you a piece of paper, hoping that his or her remarks, notes, we call it a shot sheet, are going to match what's about to happen on the tape that's about to play, which isn't even the tape anymore. It's digits. I don't know what the hell it is. Some it's, it's a thing like that in a computer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm a little all over the place on this answer, but I don't know the I don't I don't know. I don't know why they market how they market. I always wondered why they market Monday night football so much when everybody knows it's on Monday night. <laughs> and it's doesn't is the audience not gonna watch because you did or did, you know, like maybe some of that money could have been <laughs> diverted elsewhere. But and to be clear, I don't want to say or I don't want it to come off as I don't think the people who are doing it now are talented. It just seems like now it kind of actually reminds me of the UFC in that they promote the UFC brand more so than the personalities. That's what I was um, referring to. By the way, speaking of the UFC, I always wanted to ask you about this. One day back in 2016, there was a huge story going on in the UFC. A guy by the name of Conor McGregor suddenly, quote unquote, retired. And he showed up on, uh, I believe it was the body issue. And he was doing a shoot in LA. And you got the exclusive interview with him. And I have to say, like, as a guy who does it day to day, I didn't hate. I was like, damn, how did Kenny May get this interview? This is unbelievable. I'm sure you remember it, the sit down, right, in that, like, sort of warehouse. How did you score that interview with Connor? For those that don't remember, he had retired. It was in the midst of the Nate Diaz a uh, rematch situation. It was right after UFC 196. I believe top of my head, it was like April, May. He was at odds with the UFC. I think he even used the term civil war to describe what was going on. How did you score that interview? My favorite part of it is I, we played scissors, paper, rock, or something <laughs> called rock, paper, rock, paper, scissors. Yeah. And, and when we played, when I was younger, whoever lost, the winner got to strike you with two fingers on your wrist, like I'm doing like this. Okay. So I wanted... Connor and I to play that game at the end. And he didn't hit me hard enough because I wanted him to hit me so hard. Like it would leave a welt, just like yeah. I, I got struck by Connor. Um, I don't know. I, I didn't, I didn't arrange it. It was arranged for me. I was doing wow. some stuff. Let me think if I, I was doing some stuff for the magazine at the time on and off. And I think it just happened. The conduit of the, he was going to be in the, magazine on the naked issue and i was in la and oh he'd be good for this interview and it just kind of happened so it was nothing that i did to be really honest i knew so little about you'll see i had to like who the fuck is you know yeah, i'm like you know so you had no, no idea like how big of a deal this interview was like we all watched it live and we're live tweeting it it was a mass it, it would be akin to like Aaron Rodgers saying, you know, he's done with the Packers yeah. and retire, you know, something like that. Yeah, no, I understood the, the, what was at stake. I'm just saying I was not an end, as you know, yeah. yeah. when you were doing the original introduction, we became closer because I was always reliant on, dude, give me the background. Give me, 
two sentences on who the hell I'm interviewing today. If I had a weird UFC interview that I didn't know much about, and you were always there to be my backstop. Um, probably could have used it on this one. Although I don't think my interview sucked. I think no, I knew good. enough about his situation, who he was, his background. It wasn't that hard to have a conversation and see where he's coming from. And, you know, I, I think it came off all right. Like, you're right, though. The scene was kind of crazy. It was it was like this urban warehouse in, in Los Angeles, kind of beat up. It looked like a movie scene. Yeah. That's probably why they chose it. They wanted something kind of gritty, you know, for this magazine shoot. Um, it was very Yeah, dramatic. I got it because, I guess, because I was there. I don't know if there was somebody higher up that said, oh, Kenny, be good for this. I don't know. They were just it was saying, great. Hey, can, you, can you be available to do this Connor thing? I said, yeah, of course. Very memorable. Uh, you also had a very memorable uh, UFC interview with Jorge Masvidal on Sports Center in the midst of his issues with the UFC. Now, going back to something we talked about earlier, um, you know, your your political leanings are very well documented. His as well, but as of late. And I'm wondering how you feel about Jorge. It seemed like you guys had a great relationship. I'm wondering if politics have strained that relationship because it's very clear that he is not on the same, you know, political spectrum as you. How do you feel about him now? Well, I remember when they had the fight staged at Madison Square Garden and Trump showed up. Yeah. Jorge said something like, no matter what you think, you got to admit he's a bad motherfucker. And I wrote him on the side and I, I, I said, you could have just called him a motherfucker. <laughs> Right. <laughs> like, um, we we had a little back and forth. I thought it was friendly enough, like civil. Like that's the thing. I, I would hope, still waiting for this to happen, the people on polar opposites even can still find a civil way to argue about where they stand, why you feel this way, why he feels that way. And I thought we did do that, but we just sort of there wasn't much to talk about. Like I came pretty hard with where I was coming from. He answered how he answered. He wrote me a very sweet note when I when I left ESPN, which I appreciate. I wrote him back a thank you. But yeah, I'd say our differences were such, and he was proclaiming it publicly, and I was completely on the opposite side. Right. I don't know. Somebody else asked me that, like how how do you maintain relationships with somebody? I I just think I think it's so clear. I mean, I, somebody from the other side is going to say the opposite thing. I'm crazy, maybe, but it's hard to continue relationships with people who continue to support that man and that ideology. I just, I think it's a line in the sand. Um, it's not quite the same. And this will likely come out after we find out about his future. So I don't want to ask you specifically about that, but your relationship with Aaron Rodgers, um, he was your last interview. He was like your last, I mean, there was a scene right after, but like that was like your last segment on your final sports center. It seemed it like you guys were very close. It, was, it wasn't the last. It was earlier in the show. For some reason, people remember that as being the last thing. Oh, and really? Okay. I don't know why that is. That everybody says his last interview, but we taped five. I wanted to do the show live. My pitch was this. Hey, if I can get these people or or most of them, can we, the show was supposed to be two hours that night, but it got cut down to about 90 because the baseball game in front of it ran long. So we were shortened. And the funny thing was, as the game went into extra innings, I was like, what if they played 28 innings and I don't even do a show? Like my last oh, okay. show was I don't do a show. That would have been kind of funny by itself. But they said, no, I wanted to say, hey, we're talking with Aaron Rodgers about his future, blah, blah, blah. Hey, let's, Aaron, hold on a second. Got the Marlins Braves for you here and then do the highlight. <laughs> Have him join in, come back to him, talk about Little League Baseball, whatever, right? Would have been more entertaining. Instead, they had me tape all these interviews at 8 o'clock, 8.30, whatever time it was, and then put them into the show, right? And I okay. think they also, as being in charge of the show, wanted to make sure, is he going to say something really crazy on his last night? Right. You know, which I don't right. think I did, except for the ending to that interview. But that right. was... When I did that, that was literally for the room. I didn't think there was any way that was going to be on TV. It was just to make the room laugh, right? Like you do right. it all the time when you're shooting different bits. You, you'll say something really stupid just to get the laugh in the room. It's going to get edited. They clean it up. But instead, they're like, this is too good. we got to leave it in. We'll just beep out the F word. Um, it was great. You were talking to him about um, his advice that he yeah. allegedly well, gave you about uh, Bitcoin okay. and whatnot. And you told him... <laughs> F you because it was down 40%. I'm yeah. just curious. The joke how was do you feel born in reality, though, because last time I yeah. interviewed him, 
<laughs> he had, I forget if that made the last interview or if we were just talking afterward. And I knew very little about crypto. I still don't. It's still like, so wait a minute. I'm going to take real money, buy some pretend money, and hope that other people take their real money and buy more pretend money, then my pretend money will be worth more real money because I can get, right? That's what it is. Right. And he says, yeah, it's, it's taken off. You got to do it. So I text him on the side, like, I don't even know how to do it. Like, who do you buy it through? How do you, you know, he tells me which place to go through. And it's true that when I bought it to the time I interviewed him next for this final show on May 24th, it had gone down 40%. And in my, in my pocket, in my head, um, I was like, I got a good joke there. It's going to be like, hey, thanks a lot for the crypto advice. It's down 40%. I also lost my job. Gretchen just wants a new comforter. Fuck you, Aaron Rodgers. You know, like it was <laughs> pretty well set up joke. It was good. Yeah, it was great. And I almost forgot to do it because I didn't do any of those interviews with notes. I was just, Marshawn's next, Sue Bird's next, Jamal's next. You know, like we had all these people, Jamal Crawford, Sue Bird, Marshawn Lynch, Aaron. It was amazing. And at the very end, the final interview was Fred McGriff, the crime dog. Because for 27 years in a month, every time there was a baseball play where somebody made a great catch or a great throw, I would always say it's endorsed by Fred McGriff, which harkened back to the Tom Amansky defensive drills video. You might not be old enough. Of of course I remember those. Those are great. People aren't old enough to know. It was one of the main sponsors on ESPN (laughs) over and over. And and it was like a three-minute ad. It was just godforsaken. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. Somebody somebody bought the time and somebody paid the money or maybe they had a lot of make goods. But Fred McGriff was the endorser, right? And the funniest part was, as I interview him about this, he's he starts making fun of the price. He's like, ah, who the hell is throwing baseballs into garbage cans? What a ridiculous thing. But <sighs> yeah, so all that stuff happened preceding the show. The Aaron thing went the way it went. The rest of it was, you know, pretty fun interview. And, um, but to answer your question that you haven't asked, I sent him a note when I heard he tested and I didn't know, I didn't know the truth of the story. I just heard that it was being rumored that it happened and more would come out. I just said, get, to, get, get well, get rest, get vaxxed. And then I put, in, unless maybe you already have, cause I didn't know. And then I didn't know he was going to go the way he went blaming the woke mob and all that. So, um, yeah, we haven't we haven't really talked since. Not that I wouldn't <laughs> talk to him, but since that text, you have not had any interaction with him. Mm-mm. Does that bum you out? It's not like I drew. I'm never talking. It wasn't like that. Right. He didn't. I wrote the last text. So right. Does that bum you out? Yeah, the whole thing was sad because, um, it's it's just funny when you you know it wasn't like we were like best buddies growing up. We just had a really good relationship for the times I was around him, which was a couple times a year, send some funny notes to each other. He'd text me during shows sometimes, hey, say this word in the next next highlight. You know, it was it was fun. He was an engaging, smart, funny guy, right? And over that, because I'm I'm not wearing a mask right now, but I'm pro mask, pro vax. I know the scientists have made a lot of mistakes because it's an evolving thing. So some stuff they might've said in March of 20 might not hold a year later or even six weeks later. I think they were on the side of trying, like Fauci as an example, who gets demonized by a lot of people who are on the on the anti-vax side. Um, so I'm gonna put my faith in people who have dedicated their whole life to fighting infectious diseases more than I am on my aunt's Facebook page or one's aunt's Facebook page. Or right. Something. You know, I, so I don't know. I, I just thought the way it was characterized was as weird as the decision itself, you know, like blaming cancel culture. Like there, there is, there's no such thing as cancel culture. There are people who behave certain ways and other people criticize it, but the people being criticized call it cancel culture. Mm-hmm. Like I, who got canceled? Like, it's just such a silly thing. They've, also weaponized stealing from the black community the word woke in the first place how that was used and now taken that and turned it into something that's just this broad criticism of anybody who's for this or against this we're going to call them woke as though that's some big weapon you know it's like i don't know all of it's it's stupid we get we got so caught up in just grabbing simple little labels and and letting that i can just use that there's I'm going to say that word and that's going to 
you know, be my neutron bomb, you know, to, to destroy the conversation of the person I'm against. I'd rather, like we were talking about earlier, wouldn't it be great? Even if I, you and I haven't talked that much about all of it, but even if we took opposing stands to actually, all right, your turn. Okay, you go, you know, instead of just immediately just pounding people with labels and criticisms that kind of destroy the the sense of any real dialogue. So speaking of football, you were a football player back in the day. You played at UNLV. You were a backup quarterback. Unfortunately, you suffered a uh, rather gruesome um, injury that changed your life. And I want to talk about Run Freely in a moment as well. I'm curious. And you did get a, a tryout with the Seahawks, who you're repping here. I'm wearing the shirt right now. Yeah, respect. Um, sweatshirt is 40 years old. Really? It yours? Was it? Was it? Yeah, your, like, this is you, what. I, this is they get. This is the only thing I got out of the deal. Come on, that's the sweatshirt that you got. Like, Forty you, years old. That is tremendous. Do you make the NFL if you don't get injured? Do you think? Um, USFL. Okay, hey, it's not bad. Yeah, you'll, you'll, there were good players in the USFL. I don't know. I I look at it like I thought I was as good or better than the rookie that I was going against. Mm-hmm. He didn't make it either, though. They kept the same three quarterbacks. It was Jim Zorn, Dave Craig, and Sam Adkins. And then there were a few rookies like me trying to be the third guy, you know, if if you could make the team. I was hoping to last long enough to get noticed, to get picked up somewhere, go to Canada, USFL. Like, I could throw. I can still throw. I was a better thrower than I was a quarterback, probably. You know, okay. A little distinction there. Um but I think I was still getting better. Like I was kind of a late bloomer. Ninth grade, I played fifth quarter. Do they even have fifth quarter where you're from? I don't think so. So fifth quarter was for, there's four quarters in football. Fifth quarter was for the guys who didn't get into the lawful fourth quarters. Okay. And they'd stay for another 20 minutes wow. and the scrubs would have a little half ass game go in from the 20 or whatever it was. And I just was not, I was undersized. I was like 5'8", 135 pounds. And kind of grew in to my height. I jumped up six two a couple years later. So I thought each year I was getting better and better and filling out and learning the game and broke my leg at Oregon my junior year, 1980, where I was a backup. Larry Gentry was the starting quarterback that year. The next year I come back and play. Sam King was the starter. He led the nation in passing yards. Wow. I was second. A guy named Alan Reynolds was third, and a guy named Randall Cunningham. Wow. Freshman just coming in. You knew he was going to be great. He had way more talent than all of us, but, you know, he was brand new and we all knew the offense better and Sam was the starter. Um, But yeah, the Seahawks had offered Sam a free agent deal and he turned it down. He was going to go to Canada. My coach, Tony Knapp said, Hey, if you like Sam, you should look at the guy who backed him up. You know, he throws as well as as Sam. So I went up there and threw. And the day that I, I went for my, my tryout, they just bring people out, right? It's not like some special one o'clock tryout thing. It's more like, all right, he's rolling in. Let's who's around the building. Hey, you come out and run some routes. Steve Largent happened to be in there lifting or something. So I got to throw the Steve Largent for my tryout. Wow. Which was beneficial to me for sure. And so it was just a tryout, right? You never played in a preseason game or anything like that. No, I signed a deal that day, worked out in Kirkland for like two weeks, their, their headquarters, their first headquarters. Then the training camp was across the state near Spokane in a place called Cheney. And day one, I failed the physical, ah. got tossed out. They gave me $10 at the airport. I got a five, four ones and four quarters and this shirt. Wow. I just happened amazing. to put this on. We found this recently and went to a soccer game this morning for our youngest and just threw on a Seahawks shirt for the hell of it. Um, while you were at UNLV, is it true that you were an usher at Caesars? You you worked at the uh, the Tyson, I believe it was Larry Holmes fight in 1980, correct? Ali Holmes. Ali Holmes. Why did I say Tyson? My man. Uh, Ali Holmes. That's insane. You, so you were there for that. Dude, it was an amazing time, which is funny that I'm back with Caesars, not to plug them again, but the first place I visited on my recruiting trip was Caesars. The couple of coaches took me out to show me the town. First stop, Caesar's Palace, the old moving beltway. So this was legal, not an NCAA violation. Right, right. Weren't paid. Maybe we got tips, but who knows? Sure, sure. Um, the football players and some of the other athletes 
got to be the ushers at these big prize fights. And in the old days, you could look up the old pictures. They used to set up like a temporary grandstand behind Caesar's palace. Uh -huh. And, and, Ali Holmes was one of the, the, I mean, one of those, you know, to be there for Ali was pretty amazing. Holmes took it easy on him that night. There was a sad fight because Ali was past his prime. Right. Probably should have been done by then. Um, but I got to escort someone named Nabila Khashoggi, the daughter of Adnan Khashoggi of Saudi Arabia. I thought she was like a princess or something. Like They said, you make sure she gets down to the ring. And I lost her for a second because it's just a sea of people. You know what I'm talking about? At, the big fights there's this procession there's 80 people in the entourage or whatever and so i'm like fighting through people to get her back i got her to her seat safely i got a hundred dollar tip wow well done which you know who knows what that is equating to today but i did i think leonard hearns leonard benitez <coughs> excuse me there were some others they also had an indoor facility there they don't, it doesn't even exist anymore but it was a thrill. It, the funniest part was if you were a starter or close to it, like second string, you know, halfway notable, you got to sign down by the ring, the cool seats. Yeah. Next guys were out a little more. So that spring after my senior year and ending my senior year, getting my last one credit to graduate Holmes Cooney is fighting. I'm no longer really on the team. I'm just finishing up my scholarship I had the worst, like I was in the rafters, just like you're quickly demoted. Right, right. Somebody gave me a handy wipe for a tip. I'm like, he says, it's hot out there, kid. You know, like, <laughs> do me a good. not bad, though. You get those to watch were, all those. I mean, such a thrill. You're 19, 20, 21 yeah. years old. You're at Caesars Palace, biggest sporting event happening. You know, just to be just the electricity of it. You know, how it is at, at of course. the UFC fights or any, you know, major fight. There's just this something in the air. I was, in fact, I took a knee next to Jack Nicholson to watch the fight. He was like, here to the wall. That is amazing. So you, you, you're at UNLV. Then you say that, you know, the football career doesn't work out. You get into the local sports scene in Washington, leave the local sports scene. I'm just curious. I, I, I've heard you talk about essentially quitting um, even though you don't get picked up by ESPN and you work as someone who builds garbage cans, you work at MCI, you have a bunch of odd jobs as you're kind of freelancing. What does that mean, building garbage cans? Well, like, what does that entail? And why did you choose that job of all the jobs? Well, we jumped around that. This is, I've been at the local station doing news and sports. Like I'd be the news reporter on the weekdays for two or three days, yeah. sports on the weekends. Interviewed at ESPN after the, 49ers beat the Bengals, 1989, man, I'm old. Joe Montana, John Taylor, that one. And I had a good show. It was like a good five-minute local sports guest. I sent it to ESPN. They had me send another tape. Al Jaffe said, I want to see if that was a fluke. Give us another tape. They bring me back for an interview. But I clearly wasn't sports nerdy enough for them at the time. Probably mm -hmm. never was. Um, trying to lie my way through some of the, the quizzes, you know, and just faking it. So I did okay on the tryout. I did a little little three-minute demo tape, you know, at ESPN, but they don't hire me. I go back to the Channel 11 in Seattle, Tacoma, and I ended up quitting on short notice like six months later, something like that. Long story, I won't bore you with. I basically just didn't like the way I was being handled, didn't like the way the place was going, and I probably had a little ego of, hell, ESPN likes me. What the hell do I need these people for? I'll just mm. do some freelance work and, you know, get my way to ESPN. Didn't know it'd take four years, but yeah. So I quit and I used to be a garbage man during college summers and one winter, a couple of different years in Seattle. I was the swamper, you know, the guy that hangs on the back of the truck. Yeah. yeah. This was back in the day when you had to jump off with your big silver can, go to the backyard of the guy's house dump that yeah. in and carry it to the truck, right? Right. The industry had passed me by. They were down to one-man crews, right? They had the big claw like most people see, right? So the guy, Steve Caputo, he says, I don't have any garbage work for you, but I need some cans to be built. Like I can, you know, employ you for a couple months or whatever it'll be. So you had to put the lids on. You had like these fasteners, some kind of air rivet gun or something. I'm not very mechanical. I was... Learning, a guy named Clem taught me how to do it. I had to put the wheels on, 
So, you know, when people move to a neighborhood, right, they call the garbage company and they drop off a couple cans. Right. Somebody had to put the lid on and the wheels on, right? Mine probably weren't put on very well. What I remember most about that is the Ernest Biner fumble, Cleveland Browns. Yeah. I'm in the rain in Seattle. I think it was a Saturday playoff game, if I'm not mistaken. Making garbage cans. I was just on TV like a month ago. Now making these cans in the rain, listening to that game on the radio. That, wow. That's what stood out. But what happened was I was trying to, you know, whatever job I have, you always work hard. And I worked so hard, I worked myself out of a job. There were no more cans to be made. So I looked in the paper. That was like a Thursday or Friday. And I wanted to be working somewhere on Monday. Like I'm taking a job. I'm not going to not be working. And I got, I need the money for one. I need to pay my Honda bill and insurance and whatever. And there was an ad in the paper, marketing company, looking for aggressive, energetic people, something like that. Television or radio experience is a plus. And I was like, they're talking to me. So I go to the place. Turns out it was not just marketing company, but a telemarketing company. Ah. Uh. Big warehouse in Redmond, Washington, and they were selling every little division was selling a different product. I ended up getting put in the prepaid legal insurance sales division. So I would call people up and, and try to sell them on paying $9 a month to have this insurance in the event, God forbid, you ever need an attorney. I had a pretty good sales pitch going on. Uh, that lasted a couple months. Then I got a job at MCI selling long distance back when people actually did that. I guess they still do, right? So like companies to degree, yeah. Um, all of us with these phones, we don't think about it. We just call people. But right. So I was like corporate sales, you know, having business meetings with companies, trying to get them to join MCI. All the while, I was freelancing for ESPN. The Goodwill Games of 1990 was in Seattle. They had me do that. Tanya Harding, a couple years later, I was down in Portland covering that after the scandal. Uh, I did a Sean Kemp story, a Gary Payton story, a Ken Griffey story. I did, I was like their Seattle bureau, but I wasn't mm -hmm. official. I was just when they needed me, right? And this went on and on, like three or four years of it. You're, and in your style, um, it, it really stood out, especially to a young viewer who's watching you and trying to dream what it's like to have your own style on television. The dry wit, the comedy, I mean, just kind of you're, you're, you're unflappable. You weren't, you know, shouting catchphrases like a Stuart Scott. Like everyone was very different. Your specific style, was it patterned after anyone? Did you take elements from anyone, even someone not in sports television, or was that 100% uniquely you? I mean, I think we're all product of, you know, however we got raised up, right? Like my dad was a clever, funny guy. His friend Al Drake was funny as hell. I grew up watching Johnny Carson, Bugs Bunny, Bullwinkle, Get Smart, other friends, Mark Sanser, my good friend. You know, I was just kind of surrounded by like lively, engaging, funny people, you know, and, and I was really devoted to the news, like the regular news, watching this Walter Cronkite and Huntley Brinkley way back when, you know? So like, I was kind of like, had a little comedy on one side, had the seriousness on the other side and ended up being whatever I was. I'd say in those early ESPN years, the freelance years, I wasn't doing quite what you're describing like I would do on SportsCenter because sure. there was no platform to do it anyway. And many of the times it was more like a serious feature story about a player, not serious, but you know, like a straight ahead, he's good story. Um, I think, once I got finally to ESPN, it was ESPN2, they had started this channel, I think the fall of 93, and they had, they had uh, Keith Olbermann in the leather jacket and Susie Colbert, they were the lead anchors. And it was supposed to be like the hipper sports center, right? The, the cooler X games -y sounding sports center. And Stuart Scott, Bill Pito, Deb Kaufman were, were the secondary people that did the, what they called the smash. So like at two minutes before the hour or five minutes before the hour, you do these updates. Keith goes back to, to one to be with Dan Patrick again. Stuart moves up to be the main anchor with Susie. And they need one more person. So they bring me back for like my third interview in four years. Every two years, I'm coming back to, you know, while they string me along. And Vince Doria, God love him. He was the, the boss of this ESPN2 show. And I just, sometimes I think in sales, some people say, don't bring up negatives. I'm kind of like, why don't we just face the music? You know, 
bring up the negative and, and defeat it right there. And I said, Vince, I still don't know who the fifth pitcher on the Cubs is, and I really don't care. But if you tell me to do a story on the son of a bitch, it'll be a good story. And he's like, that's a pretty good answer <laughs> of a question that wasn't asked. <laughs> and when I get hired, it's funny. They called me. I got hired on April 1st. Wow. So I, is this like the most cruel, practical joke? One, you know, Al Jaffe made the call. But I was back there May of 94. And they said, don't have aspirations. You're not going to Sports Center. You're doing this ESPN2 show. And so I was like the update guy. And I did some of the some of the field stories where, you know, then we got to start having more fun. Um, they killed our show, though. Like, I forget how long, how long it lasted. Another year, maybe something like that. And then we got all these people on contract. We got to put people somewhere. They ended up putting me on the car racing show, brand new car racing show called RPM. RPM today, RPM tonight. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know a damn thing about car racing. I knew probably less about car racing than I did UFC before the Connor interview. But I learned, you know, I, I bothered Benny Parsons and Jerry Punch and Ryan McGee and all these good people that knew the sport. And they kind of learned me up and ended up really enjoying it. Got to go to Daytona 500 and Indy 500, all these cool events and, and grew to really to, to care about it. You know, I, I'm not like a, every Sunday I have to watch the four hour race, right. but appreciated the sport and got to know a lot of the people and then kind of merged over to starting to do sports centers and off we went in fact i believe on the last episode of rpm tonight you played a a, a voicemail a message from david letterman who was yeah. telling you that you can't cancel the show right <laughs> um we did a thing called the morning wake up call is what we called it and the premise they never understood it fully they finally agreed to experiment with it a few times I said, no, I want it to be really low tech, like a still picture of a guy holding a phone and then me holding the phone. And it's just like a nice little talk. David Letterman actually also gave us earlier than that, like a two hour interview. He loved car racing, you know, he right. was Ray Hall steam and um, Letterman Ray Hall. Right. And it was, that was a fun night. It was supposed to be like a 20 minute interview. And we changed tapes three times back when you used tapes. Yeah. And then leaving his studio there in New York, it was after one of his shows. Um, he just happened to come to the street at the same time. His car got brought up as we were loading our equipment. He says, Hey, Ken, you want to go out to dinner? I'm like, uh, you know, I'm kind of like, now I'm worried about my team. You know, am I going to drive home separate? Am I ditching them? I took like half a step toward him. He said, I'm just fucking with you. And he gets in his car. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what's funny about that, about a year later, two years later, maybe Dale Earnhardt won the 500 the next year, he was sort of like our host, co-host for two or three shows. There was a little tradition. They had the last year's winner would help with the shows the following year. In the middle of a break, he asked me if I want to go to dinner. And in my head, I'm like, he's doing the same thing Letterman. Did. Like, that's the first thing. But it wasn't. He really invited me to dinner on his boat wow. and could have been a sweeter guy. I mean, he, I had a cold. And he was trying to find the right cold medicine. You know, Try this, try this. And at the end... I'm looking at old family photo albums with Dale and Teresa, his wife. And Dale looks as well. Oh, shoot, I got to go. He had to be at some nine o'clock, you know, hospitality thing. He says, I, so I get up like, oh, it's time for me to go too. He says, no, no, stay and look at the pictures. He gets to the door and he turns back and goes, but don't stay too long. <laughs> that is amazing. I can't imagine, like those stories, you could probably write a book of all these. Would you, would you ever write a book? You know what? Maybe you just inspired me to. I mean, you got so many great stories, so many interactions. Can I ask you, and I'll I let you go. Tell, can I tell one that I'm fond of? Please, go it ahead. Might, it might preempt a question because people always ask, "What's your what was your favorite? If you had to pick one thing, you know, by far. Okay. So way back when, when I was first a TV reporter in Seattle, Stevie Wonder was in town to kick off the In Square Circle concert tour that was named after his album. And I talked them into going, let's get Stevie Wonder. Come on, Stevie Wonder. And, and I had to like beg them to let me go to this thing. They want me to go to some city council meeting on, you know, utility rates or something. So instead, we go to the Coliseum, now the, now the Climate Pledge Arena. Mm -hmm. And they tell us, no interviews. You can shoot five or ten minutes of B-roll, get out. You know, all of a sudden we look up and there's a reporter up on stage interviewing him. Oh, look, what the hell? So we go sprinting from the back of the gym. I'm like the last guy in. My mic I'm like literally shaking. I'm so nervous to be in Stevie Wonder's presence. I end up setting my mic on his keyboard 
And so he's answering something about world peace or whatever. And it's like, oh, you know, you hear like, oh, no. noise. yeah. And he just coolly turns the knob to zero and keeps wow. talking. He didn't get, and then I realized, oh, I'm an idiot. I pulled the mic back. So all these years later, I used to play in the celebrity legend softball game at the all-star break. Yep. And Tim Scanlon was the head of baseball, the ESPN. And I said, Hey, Stevie wonder is from Detroit, Saginaw. The all-star game is going to be in Detroit in like two or three weeks. He's in a concert in Philadelphia. It was the live eight concert. They called it to relieve African debt. That was the mm-hmm. premise of the, of the event and talking about the G eight nations. Right. And Stevie's the headliner. I said, can I go try to get him to do something that we'll use in three weeks, right? And tie the two together. He's like, well, do you have anything set up? No. Do you have a camera? No. Do you have a press pass? No. So, all right, go for it. I think you'll pull it off. Like, that's the kind of face Tim Scanlon had. So I fly down, get a crew, and I'm, like, trying to figure out how do we even get to the person who might get me close to even ask the question of hoping he'll say yes, right? I got the flimsiest press pass ever. We're like six blocks away from the concert in some stupid tent watching on monitors. I'm like, well, I'm never going to get them from out here. So I just said, screw it. I just start trying, right? It's going to be a a mission to get Stevie Wonder. I get out by his trailer. They have this compound closer to the the stage. And they got all these VIP trailers. And people are getting waved in like Natalie Portman gets waved in. Will Smith gets waved in. They're all going to greet Stevie. And then the guy at the front looks right at me, I think. And he's like, big smile. And he's, he's come on, come on. Come on. I was like, how the hell do they know who I am? Like, <laughs> all right. So I take like half a step. Don Cheadle walks by. Wow. Oh, him man. But I didn't give up. I ended up getting a lanyard from a Teamster who had an extra one. He recognized me, asked what I'm doing. I tell him my quest. Now I'm backstage. So now I'm in the action. Now I got a shot. I find his guy. He says, after the event, you stand right here. He'll either say yes or no. It's your problem to pitch him. You know, I'm not going to pitch him for you. I told him what I wanted. And Stevie's line was, I can't be at the baseball all-star game. I have a high ankle sprain. Wow. And he crushed it in one take. Then I told him the story about how we call. I said, I feel like we've collaborated because I I pressed your button and you turned it down. (laughs) He's like, oh, man, let's make the album. And then. He started to walk away and I said, when's your album coming out? Cause he had another album right about that time. And he just said soon. And he walked wow, away. Wow. What a legend. Actually, yeah. I'd say of all the things I've ever done, like I've been in on some Emmys with, you know, sports center or NFL countdown, never individually, but as a team. Yep. Highest achievement was his band members knew who I was. Wow. Backstage at a different concert. So. I'll, I'll what a life. Away more of that we need more of that we need the kenny main book um and i think there's a great lesson there for young reporters who maybe don't want to shoot for the moon shoot for the stars give up too early here you are kenny main in your prime sports center superstar and you're still trying to scrap your way into that that's a tremendous story um two last quick things that's the biggest thing i always say is do not accept your no yeah right like of course. You just got you got to take the beating and and try again. Like what, what do you have to lose? Like a little bit of pride is about the only thing you're going to lose. Uh in the early days of the pandemic, the last dance, it was very nostalgic. It was it was beautiful to watch. I love the State Farm commercials because we got to see, you know, young Kenny um on the old Sports Center set. I was curious how those were shot. Like did they come to you to you know, no one was doing anything back then. Like how did you you know, get involved in that. And you I mean, that was replayed over and over again as millions of people are watching. And did you get paid for that as well? Or was that on the house? Yes. Got paid. Okay, good. And we won an Emmy. I think we were the, there was they some, great. some title. I don't know what it was. Most innovative promotion campaign, something. So you're describing the beginning of the pandemic where you could not go into the building unless you were doing a show. And we, right. we were down to one sports center a night when there's usually like four or five, right? So I shot the first part of it on a night where I was already there to do sports center. Okay. But there were a lot of pickups and a lot of changes and it was like high tech stuff, right? It was like a little bit of the stuff we should be scared of now with the deep fakes, you know, like mm-hmm. changing what people say and making it look like something happened that didn't. Mm-hmm. So without my daughter, Riley, who's working for the Lincoln project, by the way, right now. Um, oh, wow. She just graduated in Boulder and 
she pretty much made the thing happen. She should get paid because we shot the rest of it on an iPhone at my house where I'm right now. We shot one right behind me. Wow. Another one in that room over there. We had to keep trying because we'd send it to them. And they're like, oh, the, you know, there was an echo or there was this or there was that. So at this point, they just wanted my face to take just the my nose and my lips and make that be in the original shot and then take that and make it be in the 1996 shot of me back on SportsCenter, right? So it's very high tech, very convoluted. We probably shot it four more times from home on an iPhone. And then she had to figure out how to send it on the computer, which I would have never done. I would have tried to text it or something. And they're like, no, 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 you got to go through. What is it? We transfer, you know, we have, yeah. we're using all these things that I'm not very aware of and not very good at. It's good to have young children who can help you, yeah. uh, at least ones in, in college, not so young anymore, but who are well-versed in these things. Uh, why should people check out runfreely.org? Thanks for asking. If I had time, I'd run and grab the device. If you'd like to, I'd be happy to. I mean, it's, I, I feel bad. I've taken up too much of your time. No, I'm enjoying this. Wait, okay. Is it? Go I grab have, it. I have a lunch in 21 minutes. I'm going to show it to you. Don't go anywhere. Okay, I'm going to stay here. And uh, I'm going to wait for Kenny. I don't know how long this is going to take. Uh, this is the beauty of doing these types of interviews. This has been great. Here you have a wonderful shot of uh, Kenny's living room, basement, window. What a legend. What a career. 27 years and one month at ESPN. The icon. Done it all. The main event. Sports Center. The commercials. Sit down interviews. I'm back. This is Sports Center commercials, other commercials, and I believe he's coming back. He's got this uh, great organization that's a part of runfreely.org. Oh, this wow. Is it. See this? Yeah. Looks like a fake leg, kind of. Mm -hmm. Goes up past your knee. So, in short, go to run freely. R U N F R E E L Y, runfreely.org, runfreely.org. So, after I ruined my leg, in college, I played one more year because when you're young, you're like, whatever. But every year, every decade, bone spur surgeries, metal in, metal out, you know. When I got to like 50-ish, I'd say, early 50s, it was really bad. Like bad, bad. Like every, when I was flying around the country doing not sports centers, but all these worldwide trips and football stories, and magazine stories, and a lot of wear and tear. And so sometimes just getting off the plane, you're like, you know, like, just had to like yeah. make the joint work again because it would lock up. And I was to the point, I went one week to three different doctors. I went to the fusion guy, which they lock it in place, right? The replacement guys who said they wouldn't want me to run. I said, could I play flag football and softball? No, 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 you can't run with it. I said, well, why would I get the surgery to not run when I can already not run? That's what a stupid exercise. Then the last guys were the amputation guys. And I was actually considering it like I was in pain every day wow they were great because they were like you're too young for this go find a better therapist who I just coincidentally ran into the right guy who led me to a chiropractor in Seattle Nino Pribic in Kirkland Washington if you need some chiropractic and he just kind of brought it back to life I got this one device that was like the station wagon compared to the Ferrari that this is and then a few years later, run into this guy in Gig Harbor, Washington, named Ryan Blanc. And he's making these devices for veterans who come back with similarly bad ankles for various reasons. And I literally ran on day one, stuck that thing on that, you know, they have to make it just for you, right? Like special right. mold and all that. But I got on the treadmill day one, no fear, just 15 miles an hour, I'm sprinting. And couldn't even believe the gift that I had. You know, I was like crying for two hours. Called wow. Gretchen, told her what this miracle was, and we started the foundation right afterward, which I said, run freely. And we've just raised money to buy one at a time, basically. Like, we, we it's not like a building. There's no staff. It's just it's me and my Twitter and a girl named Mara in South Carolina who helps out and my wife and friends. And, and we just try to keep raising one at a time. So we right now we got a list of, I think, we have three guys waiting on hold just like hey when we get the money you're next you're next you're next and it's it's worked out though because had it been a bigger enterprise i'd be worried that we'd have 200 people waiting and maybe there are 200 people out there but 
it's worked the way it's worked. You know what I'm saying? Where, okay, we got a couple in line. Oh, somebody just sent in five grand. Cool. Now we're up to eight grand. You know, we just, we just kind of very small time, very mom, mom and pa foundation, but nothing is kept. All the money, every dollar, you know, goes to buy these things. We write a check, send it to the guy in Gig Harbor, tell so-and-so, hey, contact the guy, you're up next. And, and it's worked out pretty well. So I think we've, in three years, we're close to like one a month. Not exactly, but right in that neighborhood. So that's not bad. Beautiful thing. Runfreely.org. Um, I see you promoting it. I love when there's something big happening in your life. You always find a way to attach that to it so that more people can see it. Very smart. Uh, you're, you're a beautiful man, Kenny Mayne. Thank you for everything. Thank you for uh, being so kind to me when you didn't have to be. Um, and I know that, you know, you say I was helping you with this stuff, but like there was a point early on, I was like, I can't believe Kenny Mayne is texting me right now. This is <laughs> insane, surreal for someone who always kind of felt like on the outside looking in. It really meant a lot, uh, and I wish you nothing but the best. It's great to see you pop up doing these other things. Independent Kenny is a force to be reckoned with, dare I say. So congrats on a great run, but I'm looking forward to this next chapter, and I'm looking forward to that book as well. You have some stories to share, and I think it would be great to read them. So thank you for the time. Really, uh, this was a real treat, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching this episode of the Ariel Hawani Show. If you want to check out some of our old episodes or if you want to stay up to date with all the great things that we are doing here, please do like and subscribe to this year page. Trust me, some really cool things are coming up.